uh, the economics is very simple. When you, you can't look at a nation's uh, trade deficit with one country, and you need to look at the overall trade position uh, because when countries don't save and the U.S. does not save, the economics are clear. We have to import surplus savings from abroad, run massive uh, current account uh, and trade deficits to attract the capital. Last year, we had trade deficits with 102 countries. China was the biggest, but there's still 101 other countries. And so if you squeeze one out of 102, but don't fix the savings problem, the Chinese piece just goes somewhere else. And it's most likely going to go to a higher cost producer, which taxes the American people. Trade wars are easy to lose. The president says they're easy to win. He's completely wrong on that. Uh, trade wars uh, will trigger responses by those who have tariffs imposed on them. And um, uh, the combined impact will be negative for economic growth for both countries engaged directly in the conflict and for the broader world economy through supply chain linkages. Uh, trade war is a negative for China, a negative for the United States, and a negative for the world economy. Uh, the, the U.S. government has not really laid out a compelling uh, case uh, to um, justify the way in which uh, Huawei has been singled out uh, for um, uh, the type of treatment that it is now uh, being uh, subjected to. Uh, and this recent effort to put um, uh, Huawei on uh, the so-called restricted entity list, which would cut off Huawei's uh, access uh, to global supply chain, basically, but especially to its U.S. suppliers, uh, is, is a, I think, a clear attempt to um, uh, squeeze the company and po possibly put the company uh, out of uh, uh, business. Why is this the case? Why are we doing this? Uh, and I think it boils down to this fear that the U.S. has, um, this existential fear that Chinese companies will dominate future technologies. And there's you know, no technology that's more obvious uh, in terms of, um, uh, you know, its potential to shape and reshape uh, the landscape in the years ahead than, than the 5G uh, internet and telecommunications platform. Huawei is the world's leader in that. The U.S., for reasons that have never been articulated, is nowhere. Uh, you know, and, and to me, the biggest question that we in America should be asking right now is why haven't U.S. companies made progress in developing our own 5G capability? And is our response to our lack of product in this area, uh, is our only response to attack the leader and to try to put the leader out of business? Or shouldn't we be doing something more productive uh, than that? But that issue doesn't get addressed. And, and um, uh, Huawei is uh, certainly, um, you know, uh, uh, a victim of, 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 of those, those circumstances. The concerns that the U.S. has raised are legitimate. In many cases, um, the allegations, especially the ones uh, leveled by uh, the U.S. Trade Representative Robert Lighthizer in a long report that he submitted to the president in March of 2018, uh, the evidence in su support of those allegations surprisingly weak, uh, evidence that actually could not be admitted uh, into a U.S. court of law if it was, in, in fact, um, uh, attempted to do so. And, um, you know, I'll just cite two things uh, in that regard. One, um, uh, the sort of the accepted uh, estimates of U.S. intellectual property theft that America suffers every year um, has been uh, put in the range of 225 to 600 billion dollars a year. Uh, and the bulk of that is attributed to China. Uh, where does this number come from? Good question. Uh, I looked at it. Uh, it comes from a very um, 
uh, high-profile, prestigious group called the uh, IP Commission, headed up by former U.S. Ambassador to China, John Huntsman, former Director of National Intelligence, uh, Admiral Dennis Blair. Um, and uh, the estimates are weak. Uh, th they have no direct way of measuring how much intellectual property is actually stolen by anyone, let alone China. Uh, and so they created these phony models based on drug trafficking, trafficking um, uh, illicit financial flows, and other bad characteristics of any economy, uh, and um, use these models to come up with this ridiculous estimate of 225 to 600 billion. Uh, number two is the issue of forced technology transfer. The idea that um, uh, companies that want to do business in China must do so in the structure of a joint venture. Uh, and one of the requirements of a joint venture, according to the U.S. Trade Representative, is that American partners are forced, coerced, into turning over their technology uh, to uh, China. Uh, joint ventures, by definition, are voluntary arrangements where U.S. companies willingly enter into a contract with a Chinese partner. And of course, when they do that, and their goal is to build a business together, there will be a lot of sharing of ideas and people and technology, uh, product design and the like. But the allegation that the um, U.S. Trade Representative Lighthizer makes is that this transfer is forced, done against the better wishes of the American partner. Uh, and that's a serious charge if that were to, to be the case. Uh, and yet he admits in his own report, on page 19 of the report, you check it, uh, that there's no evidence to support what he's saying. And the only evidence that he uses are surveys from places like the U.S.-China Business Council uh, that um, uh, seem to indicate that some U.S. companies, uh, a very large minority of them, uh, are uncomfortable with doing business in China. That's very different than um, the allegation uh, of forcing a company to turn over uh, its core technology. I was a senior executive in a joint venture in, in, in China, CICC. I knew many businessmen and still do who are senior executives in their respective joint ventures. Um, and none of them feel uh, that there is a coercive aspect in which their technology is being uh, taken from them. There are some areas such as um, pharmaceuticals and drugs where there are stringent requirements um, for a variety of reasons, may have to do with public health policy, where when there's a joint venture partner, uh, that foreign partner has to be um, uh, very direct in explaining the nature of the product that they're producing uh, uh, together. Uh, but again, the pharmaceutical companies who enter into those contracts, they're not forced to do it. They do it voluntarily. So um, these structural issues are big, big issues. Uh, and unfortunately, when you're going to use these structural issues uh, as the basis for uh, imposing major tariffs uh, on your largest trading partner, you need to have good, solid, uh, uh, irrefutable evidence. We have the opposite. We have weak evidence. As I said earlier, it would not be admitted in a U.S. court of law. Look, I, I think uh, Professor Allison's done very interesting work, but I think um, the fears of a hot war are overblown. Uh, you know, he studied uh, the conflict between rising and ruling powers uh, back over the last 600 years. And he's um, come up with, I think, 16 examples of conflicts, 12 of which have uh, ended in uh, a military war. Uh, the last three did not, though. Uh, I think the power of weapons of mass destruction is so... <clears throat> uh, enormous right now 
that the moral anchor of both countries would prevent that from occurring. Uh, but I think he's right to recognize the, uh, the nature of uh, uh, the conflict uh, in a broad historical context. My own sense is that rather than worry about the hot war, we should be much more concerned about the likelihood of a cold war. Uh, which would be an ongoing conflict between the U.S. and China, which um, uh, I think is a very real has a very you know realistic chance of occurring, uh, and that would also be a negative uh, for uh, both countries uh, if this conflict were to endure uh, after uh, you know we resolve these um, short-term differences.